Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for braving the rain. I hear it's pouring outside. Um, Welcome students, faculty, and guests. Today we are thrilled to have the choreographer, performer, writer, teacher, and speaker Liz Lerman with us. Liz is going to be speaking <laughs> to her most recent work, Wicked Bodies, which, as she writes, is a history of sly, grotesque, sensual, wildly creative women that every culture carries in cliches, stereotypes, and fictions because they are actually very real and very present. Students, my ever-present question for you, what does this have to do with me? The answer is everything. How do we celebrate, erase, or criminalize the feminine? These are particularly relevant questions in American politics right now. As artists, how can we reinvent patriarchal images of the feminine as our own? How do we represent ourselves? How do we do this whether we identify as women or not? Who gets to be a witch? It's a question of empowerment. This is something that Liz explores in all of her work, not just in dance. As always, but this year in particular, forum faculty have been working with issues of empowerment and critique. How do we drop our individual assumptions and give the power back to your work? How do we honor your perspective as artists and designers through the work you make? Our conversation has been heavily influenced by Liz's critical response method, which is a critique method designed to elicit that result. Liz will be introduced today by forum faculty Hannah Brancato, who's been working with her this year on strategies for building resilience and critique. Um, I'll let Hannah and Liz speak further, but I will say this, claim your power, demand to be seen, and demand that your work be seen as the powerful magic it really is. Hannah, thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to today's event. Um, my name is Hannah Brancato. I'm a forum faculty member, as um, Elizabeth said, and I'm so honored to introduce Liz Lerman. So I'll read her bio, and then I'll just share some um, of the ways that I've been inspired by her incredible work. Liz Lerman is a choreographer, writer, educator, and speaker, and the recipient of honors, including a 2002 MacArthur Genius Grant and a 2017 Jacobs Pillow Dance Award. Key to her artistry is opening her process to various publics, resulting in research and outcomes that are multidisciplinary, participatory, urgent, and funny. Current projects include building the Atlas of Creative Tools, an online resource, her touring production of Wicked Bodies, and the retrospective at Yerba Buena Art Center for the, Art, uh, Center for the Arts titled Reflection and Action. She founded Dance Exchange in 1976 and led it until 2011. Liz is the author of several books, including Teaching Dance to Senior Adults, Hiking the Horizontal, and most recently co-authoring Critique is Creative with John Borsell, who's also here today, um, which addresses the critical response process, a communication system for giving and receiving feedback that she invented decades ago, and that if you're in my class, you've had a lot of experience with, and I bet a lot of other forum folks have as well. She is currently Institute Professor at the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts at Arizona State University and a fellow at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, also located at ASU. So my students can attest to how excited I am that Liz Lerman is here today. Last week I was telling them about it and they were sort of laughing at me because I was geeking out so much. Um, but I, you know, I've learned a lot from Liz Lerman's work um, and something that I've observed in some of the conversations that we've been able to have this year is that um, a big part of Liz Lerman's genius comes from a spirit of curiosity that she brings to learning and, and listening to how artists do their work and an interest in creating tools to support artists in our creative process. And so I think that her generosity and openness to finding ways to mo motivate all of us to, as she says, get back to work, to be excited to get back to work after receiving feedback um, has really been inspiring um, useful and very effective for me in my own activist organizing practice, my teaching practice, and my own art practice. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, I've been surprised and humbled by the fact that that spirit of generosity extends to being willing to talk about new projects with me, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, the Critiques to Build Resilience project here at MICA. And I think that, yeah, again, I think that's a big part of what, what makes Liz Lerman a genius, um, as she has been named. And so today we're really lucky to learn more from her about Wicked Bodies, 
um, her brilliant recent work about the imagery and mythology of the witch and how the creativity and brilliance of women has been erased, criminalized, sexualized, and more throughout history. Please join me in a very warm welcome to Liz Lerman. Stevie, is it possible to light the audience uh, so I can see you there? Thank you. It's very, very nice to be here, to be back in Baltimore where I had the good opportunity and privilege to live for a few years. Um, I'm grateful to all the people who made it possible. And it's really fun to be introduced in a room where we uh, accept that magic is actually part of our lives and very necessary. I would add that the labor behind creating magic is also very necessary and part of our worlds. Some of what I want to talk to you about today, I've said a million times, but some is new. Some the challenge put forward by the people asking me to come <clears throat> to actually think about a new work because it's still so new, I haven't quite been able to be efficient in my descriptions. <clears throat> but let me start with something ancient. Um, I think there was a time when people danced and the crops grew. I think that they drew in order to preserve memory. And when they put the animals on the caves, they were trying to understand their relationship to the animals that they still felt they were. I think there were, in that time and since that time, People have used pigment on their bodies for identification, representation, and saying, I'm here. I think they wrote poems and sang songs because they had to hold the stories that were being told at every gathering, every festival, and maybe at every time they ate together. <clears throat> I think, and I know this from my own family's histories, that over the thousands of years that people migrated, whether refugees, enslaved, choosing to leave, having to leave, leaving because the climate changed, what did they bring with them? Well, they brought the objects that people had exchanged among themselves, crafted from nature, that expressed their love and the fact that they were once here. I believe that all of us are descendants from those people and that we carry all that knowledge with us. Each one of you, me, your beautiful faculty. We happen to live in a time where maybe people don't entirely understand the power and value of the knowledge that we hold. And so it turns out, not only are we the makers, but we are also the people designing the systems or changing the systems or affecting the systems so that the true nature of what we want to offer our communities, our cultures, ourselves, our families, the true nature of that can exist in this world. And that's a lot of work. And sometimes, you know, we just operate entirely from this place of self. I've just got it, you know, I got to understand this dream I had, or I have to understand this drive that I have to do this crazy thing that my family doesn't understand, or I, it's very, very personal. And then sometimes, well, we wake up in the morning and we find out that people in the streets of Israel are burning the streets. We find out that all over the world, people are trying to make a place for humans and other species to live in a better relationship. And who's going to do that? We are a major part of that. So if there's anything else you take away from today, it's this idea that you, you, you have a lot of the knowledge already. You're living with it. And that some of our job is figuring out how to use that in a world that may or may not be accepting. <clears throat> so I didn't know I would ever come to say what I just said. I grew up with a classical dance training thinking I was heading right for a ballet company. And then everything changed. 
the civil rights movement, the death of my mother, a bunch of things happened. So I want to say that, I mean, you see me here and you know, this beautiful thing that Hannah said about my influence on her, which it's mutual. She influenced me a lot in those conversations. <clears throat> this, this comes as we are open to influence. And I thought, just so you might know this to be true, I would just show you a little tiny clip from a very long time ago. This, these films emerged because of this retrospective that's at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco right now. It's a short little minute, and uh, if you'll indulge me, it'll just give you a little tiny link into the nature of how change happens. Can we do the, the, the those one? This one? and I are pairing up here. <laughs> We're a team. My mother got sick, and during her illness, uh, the last three months of it before she died, I spent with her. We talked a lot about um, her family and about her history and her roots. And I knew since I'm a choreographer, that is one of the ways in which I can integrate best the experiences of my own life. I knew I would need to be making a dance about that and uh, knew that I would need to have older bodies in it, that it wouldn't be enough to have younger people just come in and pretend like they were my great, great uncle Jaime or whatever. flavor. Uh, when I started dancing with old people um, in 1975, uh, you have to understand it's pre-jogging. Like nobody in the streets was out there running around hardly wearing anything and exercise. None of that. So the idea that you could move your body and then more or less move it with somebody old was ridiculous. Like I said, I didn't start out trying to do that. I didn't even try to do it as a social impact statement. I did it because it was the only way I could get through my mother's death. And then the world opened up. So some of how I have come to work through these things is to notice how I'm working as an artist like within the, the technique, the craft, and how that had to change if I was gonna have those people on stage that you just saw, they did. They were quite wonderful. They welcomed my mother into heaven, uh, sunglasses and all. Um, <clears throat> so part of that is getting our craft in gear. But part of it again is how do we, how do we convince the world that it's worth it? So here's what happened to me. I started touring with a professional dance company at the same time I started to work with the old people. <clears throat> and people would say this to me, Liz, when your company's at the Kennedy Center, that's up here. And when you're in the nursing homes or the prisons or the schools, which I began to do, you're, you're down here. This is art. This? Oh, I don't know, I guess you wanna do it, okay. Or people did this. And they said, this is the community practice. This is what you need to be doing. This is important. And then they would literally say, why are you still performing in theaters? Why are you doing that? It's old, it's white, it's European, it's male, don't do it. <clears throat> For me personally, and I bet you can translate this yourself into your world, this was so impoverished. Like, why would I want to choose? So I did this. Just watch for a sec, because this is the most important thing to take home today. Really easy with my hands. Then I could see that I wasn't a choice. Well, it's a choice. You can't be everywhere at once. But the reason you would choose one thing over another had to do with context, had to do with what you were trying to do, had to do with the nature of the commission, had to do with, well, where the money was. A million reasons. But for me personally, 
whether I decided to walk the long pathway between the nursing home and the Kennedy Center, meeting amazing artists along the way who were also walking that path, or whether I wanted to turn it into a circle. These things are not so far apart. They are informing each other constantly. So it was then and there that I determined not to be singular. Now, I know people in this room will choose that path, and that's fine. It's good. Some of us are meant to pursue that. But what, uh, what this notion allowed me to do was to discover the possibility of where dance could live, how it could live, how many different ways it could live, and how much different subject matter I could get into. I just want to say one more thing about this. We could spend the rest of the time. I wrote a whole book about it called Hiking the Horizontal, which if, you're, if this speaks to you, grab it and you can read through it. It's pretty quick. <clears throat> if you're in this world and you want to make a distinction between things, you literally have to put the thing down in order to make the distinction. So let's just say for a minute I want to make a distinction between dance therapy, community-based dance, and performance dance. These are different things. In this world, I can only do it by saying one is better than the other, or more important than the other, or worth funding than the other. But when I do this, now I can make distinctions without rancor. And the distinctions are one of our most creative things to do. I'm not you. We are not the same. How are we different? And once we start doing that, and without rancor, it's not better, good, best, better, it's not. And this is where critical response, which we'll get into later today in one of the classes I'm busy, this is where critical response is so helpful. Because it helps you find a way to navigate this. I'll give you one quick um, example of why I mean how this works, and then I'm going to jump into Wicked Bodies. <clears throat> so for five years, I got to be artist in residence at Children's Hospital in Washington, DC. This was really interesting. I went once a week. I had a piano player with me. We would roll the piano through the hallways. We would stop sometimes just in some of the rooms. But usually, we would organize a little gathering, and they would bring um, the kids out and the families, and we would well, we would dance for like 30 to 45 minutes. <clears throat> now, at that time, the standard for being a great choreographer was, could you make up movement that nobody had ever seen before? How many of you feel the pressure to be original? Yeah, it's huge. I personally think it's impossible. Creativity and originality are not the same thing. We can, the, we can build our creativity like crazy. Originality, well, that's another thing. But the pressure to make something that no one had ever seen. Well, when I went to Children's Hospital, and I'm sitting with a group, do you think it matters that the movement had never been seen before? What the hospital staff said to me, here's what they wanted. Could I keep this, the young people dancing for 30 minutes? Could they enjoy their bodies just for a second? Could their family see them for a minute, not sick, but healthy? Could we tell stories with our bodies that would help them understand how they were feeling? Remember the, wall, the, the, the animals on the wall in the caves? Could they figure out their own relationship to their own bodies? This was like a spectacular set of commissions. And what it did for me as an artist is change me as an artist so that when I took those skills back to the rehearsal room, oh, well, actually, with those skills in hand, we could make some interesting movement. And I just have to tell you, by the way, at Children's Hospital, the kids that were all wound up or bandaged up, they did make movement I'd never seen. So, so it was unique. This is what I mean about wanting to be on the horizontal, that things inform you, that you listen to the context, what's being asked, what you hope for, what, what's demanded by the community or by yourself. And it very well might be that this year you are working entirely on your own self, from yourself, your own self-expression. Great. Next year, you may find yourselves wanting to respond to something that's happening in your city or your home country or something, and you're going to expand. That's the horizontal. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to take uh, 30 seconds because I need to take a drink of water. I would like you to turn to somebody next to you. Now, this is a little tricky in a room like this. 
because you know you go this way and you go that way and then nobody's talking to you <laughs> and you feel terrible and you get mad at me so don't do that <laughs> just make sure you're talking to somebody actively join just could you just tell each other for a second what's one thing you just heard right now you want to remember because we're going to go on and this stuff's going to slide into the past so real quick talk to each other for a minute and i'll be right back i'm getting water Okay. Yeah, you're 224. So we did, yeah. Okay, is this, is this week of bodies? Wait, hold on a second. Great, come on back, thank you. Thank you, okay, Wicked Bodies. I was in uh, Scotland, I was uh, teaching the puppet, the theater community of Scotland, critical response process, and uh, by the way, just to say, people buy your knowledge, not your dances, or I should say it for me, people buy my knowledge, not my dances. This is why it's so important to understand what you know you are more likely going to be sharing what you come to know as artists than the actual thing itself, but the thing itself is the driver, the engine that makes you do stuff. There I was, I went to an exhibit at the big museum, it was called Wicked Bodies, it was 500 years of drawings of witches. I went in not caring about witches, I came out hysterical. I could not believe what I saw. Most of the drawings by men, many, many, many of them church. Most of this, by the way, is from the West. In, in my subsequent research, of course, we find that every culture has its witches, every time frame has its witches. And a lot of the, I mean, I came out thinking, if, if all I did was reenact some of the pictures on stage, it would be the most pornographic piece I ever made. I mean, what they thought witches were busy doing, and the symbolism, and you just you 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 can, you can look it up. There's a there's a beautiful uh, book from it. <clears throat> so I decided, as I often do, wait a minute. The exhibit also contained one wall of all the witch trials around the world. The United States is there briefly, Salem, but it's a list of all the countries where the, how long the witch trials went on, and essentially how many mostly women were murdered. About 80% of the people killed as witches were women, um, or people, uh, non-binary people, people caught up in the nature of difference. <clears throat> it was shocking to me. I mean, I should have known, but it was shocking. So I decided, like I often do, when I want to make something, it's like I have no idea how they could go about killing their mothers, their aunts, their sisters, their daughters. How'd they do that? Because everybody, it was legal. It's legal. The church riled everybody up. The state did the killing across the world. We should understand that living as we do now. Who's getting killed by the state now and in what forms. So I decided I'll make a piece about it and off I went into the research of it. Eventually um, a piece emerged. Uh, I had to, we were going to premiere. Um, the piece was about a uh, witches being collected because someone wanted their knowledge. Uh, but two things happened. The pandemic hit and we couldn't premiere where we were supposed to at Jacob's Pillow. And I realized that the way I had constructed the piece, the witches were still not in charge. That I had made a piece in which they were still victims. <clears throat> so sometimes we, we go where we think we need to be. We think about it for a while, we live in it, we look at it, we get people in to see it. And you realize, well, well, maybe I needed to take that path, but I can't show that. I happen to, I love the collector in particular, the guy who was playing the collector, I just loved it, had to let it go. But the pandemic hit and nothing happened anyway, so pulled the piece back, began to think a lot about it. I decided, okay, people, witches had their knowledge because they had survived previous extinctions, did a lot of uh, look into that, it was very interesting. You want it, but we were kind of living that too. Because if you want to survive extinctions, you bury yourself, you become a generalist. Certain things that you can see in, um, in my work with the scientists that I work with. So finally, we continued making this work and I came to the idea that witches have a lot of jobs. 
And one of their jobs was to name the narrator of our history. And that they had named one 500 years ago, a guy named Kepler, you may recognize that, Johannes Kepler, who understood the first person to name the movement of the planets. His mother was a witch. She was put on trial. He got her out. It took him a year. But in my version, of the, in my version, the reason he understood the movement of the planets is because his mother was a witch and taught him. It was her knowledge that let him see that. At any event, 500 years later, this uh, white European guy is not the right guy to be our narrator. And so much of the piece is a lot of beautiful spells, a lot of little bit of history, which I might get to if we have time, and each witch bringing forward a story as if she would be the narrator of our times. And uh, for example, Ruby, who I, I hope I have a chance to show you, Ruby's idea was it's not just trauma that travels through generations, it's also love. And what would it be like if that was our, our actual acceptance, something we understood and lived with? So that, that's how the piece developed. What I'm gonna show you quickly is um, when I got uh, to have an opportunity to have an exhibit at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, we made a, um, we decided even though it's a retrospective to start in the present. And so we made a little clip that gives a little bit of the story of Wicked Bodies, which I'm gonna show you to get a little bit of sense of it. Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, show you some of the process. So we'll go to that clip. Uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, and it's still up. I'm in, I'm in collaboration with Brett Cook. I should maybe be able to show you some of that. Yeah. The introduction of the witches. Yes. <laughs> wow. The ancestral witch. The lifeline through lifetimes. The witch of tea. Transformation. Transition. Trickery. The blood witch. This witch's cells remember every kiss. The witch of in between. Water Witch, the Witch of Blackness. This witch carries the wind in, the <laughs> in their mouth and resuscitates those who need breath against the weight of the knee. And the Witch of Survival. This witch carries a true story, the story of Agnes Sampson, a common woman who was branded as a witch and tried by King James I of the Bible and tortured. I play James, and we relive and reenact this ritual of torture every year. A spell for forgiveness. Sit with me before the jailkeeper comes. Did you know that catfish are on every kind of tear up the floor of your living room? To leave the body, I will not feel. I detach myself from myself. I have music in I rest above and below, beside and between. But not with I envision myself devoid of all emotion and emotion. I am not even a vessel, so unmoved am I. I rest on the hill above and watch. She has a lot of female friends. They boil the herbs, they cool the fevers, they heal the infections, they walk on their hands and talk to their pets. They practice medicine in back alleys. They have a crooked nose and an ugly smile. I will pray to expand how we archive 
to include blood memory, everyday gestures, and the moment when two smiles meet. I will pray for one more day. Yeah, I, I really wish we could bring it to Baltimore. I, I, I really love it. There are many, many things about the piece that, that I find amazing. It, what was, um, oh, I, I hate when I'm giving talks because you have to be linear, but when you're showing dance, you can have like three things going at once and you guys can choose the direction. Um, one idea I wanna put in front of you for the next few minutes is that every time we're researching and making something, there is the possibility of multiple outcomes for the same research. Uh, I don't know if this plays precisely into all the ways you think, but I know many of you are talking about being, you know, you're gonna make games, you're gonna design clothes, you're going to have shows, you're gonna, you, you, you're already living in a hybridized wor world. But the manner in which when, like, it's, I spent seven years with the witches. So as that's happening, lots of stuff doesn't make it into the piece. And what you just saw is a three minute clip of what is 90 minutes of material. So that, you know, there's so much that doesn't get used. But it doesn't go away. And just to encourage you to pay attention to why you keep something and why you let something go. What, what are you doing there? And is that thing you let go useful again? It may be. Every time I would gather the performers, and we're gonna talk about collaboration in a minute because I, I can't make anything without being in collaboration. I, there was a time when I made a lot of solos, but I don't do that now. Uh, and I'm highly dependent on the people who circle up with me and spend seven years because once we, we got the cast and was sort of figuring it out and how we would stay together during all of the ups and downs of the last two years. This particular cast is an amazing cast. You'll never see a cast like this in a anywhere else because they all have very different dance backgrounds from, from breaking hip hop uh, to, um, well, names from the dance world that matter but maybe not so much anymore. Uh, <clears throat> but we would come together and we would make a circle like we always do. And then we did this thing which you saw a bit of. We go, today I'm the witch of and then we would say what it is. So for example, one of my favorite was I'm the witch of old libraries, but um, to be true, today I'm, I'm, uh, the, uh, I'm the witch of uh, returning to Baltimore alleys. Um, so I'm gonna again ask you to go back to the person you just talked to like five minutes ago, and I'd like you to tell each other what you're the witch of, and it can be really the first thought that comes to your mind, or you could dwell on it for and think about it. Uh, we, we, we iterated over and over again for, well, for years before we landed on the witches they actually were. So try it out for a minute, see what happens, okay? I'm the witch of. Okay, great, you guys. Does anybody want to say what they are? Anybody willing? Anybody willing to say what you're the witch of? You can shout them out. How about we shout it all at once? Witch of getting a little silly. Witch of getting a little silly. Excellent. What else? Witch of what? I am too. When, when I left Dance Exchange, when uh, this company I'd founded, they told me they were gonna compost me. And I have decided that's the best possible thing in the world to be composted, thank you. Witch of compost, what else? Tangled. Tangled, what else? Say it again. Yes. Yes. It's fun, isn't it? It's great. Okay, so now I gotta do one more thing. So. I mean, we could get into a deep reflection now, what just happened, how being the witch of tells you where everybody is in the room today, 
just for a split second, being in the present, here we are. But then we added a second round, because you saw that it's about, well, what story are you gonna tell? So it goes like this. I'm the witch of returning to Baltimore alleys, and you can tell my story if you ever lived just eight feet across from somebody. Or I'm the witch of uh, old libraries, and you can tell my story if you love the smell of books on shelves. Or I'm the witch, so you have to repeat the witch you are, don't change your witch, and then say, you can tell my story if, and see what you find out. Go. Yeah, we can do the dean and then question. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, everybody, come on back. Well, we don't have, I mean, I personally would love to hear what happened to everybody, but I love that second part and what emerges for people. And this is an example of something where we had a rehearsal process, we got into, we used, but it became something that I could also do when I'm, say, doing workshops or like a talk like this. And you would be amazed. I had to do a, t uh, a workshop recently for all the people marketing higher education in the state of Arizona, which is a hard pull right now, given our state. Um, and we did this, I'm the witch of. And you can see all the marketing people, though some may be here, I'm sorry, but squirming. But in the end, they love being witches. And they love thinking about the story, and it might even help them do a better job marketing. If you, you know, if I'm the witch of returning to Baltimore alleys and I have to market higher education, I'm gonna be sure that I have uh, a way of talking that greets the people who lived on my street. That, and suddenly I have a whole new idea what I'm supposed to be marketing. See how it works. And it's just this little tiny thing where you're not, you are totally yourself, but you're not yourself. So I, my advocacy to you is, again, in this, the way, I, the way I was talking at the beginning about all the knowledge we hold that's intuitive, I think our intuitive knowledge is our knowledge really fast. And that if we take time to figure out what we know, we can articulate what that is. And that is where uh, some amazing things can happen. And as we're making new work, we're discovering new work, we're trying out new things, we are probably coming up with processes that are gonna be useful in some other way. So, <clears throat> multiple outcomes for the same research. So during the making of this piece, I did get asked to write some articles, I had to do some talks, so that, and I decided, and I, this is you know not as old news for you guys, but new news in my world, which was to uh, make a zine. So I worked, I had a, a, a young man who was a senior in our uh, honors program at ASU, he, uh, Ananth Udupu, he's in the architecture school, but he's also a Bharatiya Natyam dancer, which is a classical Indian form of dance, and that's why I was on his committee. He was fantastic, but I, he, a beautiful designer. So we worked together to make a zine. And this zine we used uh, instead of program notes, well, we had some programs because some of the places we toured re required them, but just for you to get a feel, and maybe some of you, again, it's probably some of you know. So he, he, he constructed all of this. You know, I gave him all the research images. So that was the cover. And actually, people had a little book. Let's go on to the next page. Um, <clears throat> there you go. Uh, right. And one of my goals with this was to make sure that every artist in the piece had a voice. So when we talk about collaboration, and then we talk about collaboration across race, culture, age, differences, all the ways in which our ensemble was, making sure everybody had a voice matters and that you can see Nia Love's voice over there at the, on the cipher. Okay, let's go on. So 
part of what we did was take some writing that I did for a dance magazine and break it up. You don't have to worry about that, although if you're interested in it, I like the writing. But this is a picture from the exhibit, flying with this one. This, you would think that was ancient. It's 1922. The exhibit, somebody asked, it was at the Edinburgh Museum. Uh, and the woman who put that together, Deanna Petheridge, I went to see. We had a really good talk. Okay, so we'll go to the next page. Approach all research as if it is a crime scene. Lois Brown, the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. When she told me that, you can imagine how helpful that would be, no? That in this day and age, or here I am thinking about all these murders and all that, and she tells me that she's, um, she writes about uh, 19th century African-American women writers. Approach all research as if it's a crime scene. So there are two things here I want to say. One is to acknowledge our influences. It's not like I'm a genius. I'm a genius because I listen and am open and I care and I know Lois and I go back to people and I ask them again and then I try as much as possible to tell people where the ideas come from or what was a turning point. For me personally, it helped me understand what was I supposed to do for the audience. Like if we were gonna go into this stuff and honestly, the way these witches were killed, it's, it, I mean, torture, tor I mean, just ugh. I wasn't sure how far we were gonna go with that. But it was a crime scene. So one of the things we did, and if you get to see the piece live, is the audience comes in and they're in little pods and every pod has one of the witches and the witches are chit-chatting. You spend a lot of time just talking to the witches before the piece even goes. And then when the music starts, they start dancing right around you, all trying to build this, well, safety net so that you could dive into the crime scene. Let's go on to the next one. So this is the way Anath just took the writing and, and uh, made, it, made it beautiful. And I, uh, I was very interested in a lot of books I wanted people to see. This one is Witches, Sluts, and Feminists. It's one of the best books on witches. If you're interested, it's a very fast read. It's a wonderful book. Okay, let's go on. A spell for witches and their familiars. If we have time, I might show you a video of this. We did a pandemic version. And, but what I really want to call your attention to is um, when I was interested in the idea of extinction, one of my friends at the university and also my neighbor works on the Amazon. And he told me that the people of the Amazon believe that the animals go to an invisible city before they become extinct, which I thought is just fantastic. And I asked him, can I use that in my piece? And he said, I'll get back to you. So about six weeks later, because he, he talked to his friends in the Amazon and came back with the answer. First of all, the people that he works with down there, the peoples said, well, wait, doesn't everybody know that? which to me is just a magnificent moment of Western centricism. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> then he said, I could use it if I told it orally. So now we're at the context again of interdisciplinary practice. Sometimes we do interdisciplinary work because you can't tell the story with just one discipline. It's not enough just to dance. You'll never get it if, I, if there isn't sound or a story or whatever, or maybe you will. But sometimes we do it because if we're gonna live with respect in the world we live in now, we have to pay attention to what people need if you're gonna tell their story. And this emanates throughout Wicked Bodies and, and to me, so important right now. We can respect our differences, and certainly we need time with our own people. And we can respect the time we try to build across our differences, but how are we gonna do that? And my, my deep advocacy is if we as artists pay attention, do our work well, and share what we come to know, we can help. So I love that story, and I just told it to you orally. Okay, let's go on. Okay. It's, uh, just to let you know, is it's 2.48. Thank you. We'll finish the zine and take questions. So I hope you have questions brewing, because we're going to go there. This is, uh, uh, go the other way, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. did I go? Sorry. Thank you. There we go. This is all about the narrator, which we, d we already dealt with. Let's continue. Uh, 
more opportunity for people to talk. Each of the, each, as I said, each of the artists had a time. Um, this, this, uh, if you go back just for a second, uh, sometimes I wonder why I rehearse. Maybe I just want company while figuring things out. Or perhaps I need the performer's stories in order to find my connection to the material. Or I need accountability to my own imagination, the people in front of me making it operational. It also seems that once I have those individuals in the space with me, I need to find what the connection is, their connection between my questions and their lives. And this act, and I know some of you work in the forms you work in, maybe it's more individual, but the way in which we can help each other be accountable to this. It's, uh, in the last part of that, it says, uh, this is a combination of building a beautiful trust, but also shoring up self-doubt, which seems always to be lurking about. You know, I'm a universe of one, so I don't know if this is true for everybody, but self-doubt is a constant companion, despite it all. So how do we, what do we do? Well, again, back to critical response and that first step and why it's so important. But also, who are you working with? How are you building those relationships? And I'm just here to say that early on in my work at the Dance Exchange, I realized I was in rehearsal more than I was at home with my family. So I better have a reason to be in rehearsal. And it can't only be about the art. It has to be about how we are treating each other. What is our relationship? How am I helping you? How are you helping me? What's happening? And so we develop these practices which turn out to be useful in the world when you go out there and try to make your way. Okay, let's keep going. Oh yeah, I love this one. Anath did this for me. It's a, it's a yellow page, as you know, that's where you used to go to get that for witches. If you, need, if you need certain things done, you could go to the witch yellow pages. He was very sly. He is very sly. I just loved it. Um, yeah. One of my favorite is the Tyrell. The Tyrell is a Pakistani witch, and she wears her feet backwards, and that way you can't find her. <laughs> you got to love that, don't you? She puts her feet on backwards, and you can't find her. One of my favorite witches. Okay, let's, let's go on. Uh, this again, uh, this is where I get, I'm acknowledging conversations that changed, my, changed me while I was making it. Um, uh, yeah. So when I was worried, um, the first one, I don't really think of myself as a witch, and you know, this story of uh, not to make something without everybody. Like, could I, did I have the right to even think about witches? And Ava, who's an amazing uh, dance curator and writer, said to me, well, how do you know you're not a witch? How do you know? You, know, she, you don't know your family history. You don't know. That was very helpful. Okay, let's go on. Yeah. So uh, we've already heard that this, this was a big part of the drive. And uh, again, we won't have time to go into the stories of all the artists, but um, Elisa was in transition as we made the piece and the whole way in which, which is, we worked, to, we were all together in that. And uh, it, it's beautiful. And when uh, Elisa dances and tells the story of transition, I think uh, they get the most applause, actually. It's amazing. Let's go on. Um, <laughs> this is just the ending. But, um, so we don't have time to go into it, but King James, you know the King James Bible? Those of you that know that Bible, okay, King James is a major figure in killing witches. He, he's like erudite, brilliant, right, and he murders witches. And that over there is uh, his torso, but Anand put a cat head on him. <laughs> I liked <laughs> but we in in the piece itself we spend more time on King James and the dilemma of a bifurcated mind like his okay and I think we are done with the scene is that right yeah oh this last thing what makes a witch a witch and may, let's leave that up okay perhaps we can and then if we can bring up some light and we can see if um, if you guys have any questions or if there are uh, comments or things you want to say I would love to know and we have some time together and I'm just trying to I guess we're bringing down a, um, yeah, there are two a microphone and they're coming around. <clears throat> there are two microphones. For thank you, Lux. Okay. Can we applaud all the people that are helping make this happen while this is going on? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And Stevie back there. We're glad. Thank you. Okay. Here's one right here.
Thank you. Yeah. It's really good. You need to stretch. Your brains work much better when you stretch. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have a question or a comment or a problem or right here? Yeah. wasn't what I was expecting, to be honest. Like, I came in and I was, like, hyped up that it was, like, it's like, we have this dance person wrestler coming in, they're going to be so cool. And I'm going to just talk about witches for an hour. Like, that was just, like, blew me away. I think that's great. I'm so glad. It is really, and I just want to tell you, people love talking about witches. I love talking about witches. Yeah, uh, when I went, uh, when I was doing my research, you know, when I go to parties or I go anywhere, I always just talk talking about what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. By the way, I know some people don't. They stay really private. I just talk about it. Because you can engage a lot. So I was talking to this guy at a party. He wa he's way high up in Gore-Tex, that stuff. When I told him what I was working on, we got into the biggest conversation about whether, because the Gore they're using Gore-Tex in uh, new operations for healing hearts. I said, well, you guys are witches. He loved it. And he didn't go like this. He was like, you're kidding, really? Like, yeah, so I'm glad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We Are had you one down here. here Maybe you should take this down because I'm having trouble seeing. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I haven't used this. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> um, uh, I was thinking about the character of the witch, and it maybe like everybody like talking about witch because witch kind of is like a second identity to everyone. It's like we all kind of have a witch in our brain or something that we, that the witch is supposed to know everything about us and so, yeah, I was just thinking. Well, I love that definition of a witch and it's just interesting. Um, where I live, um, the witch is a real figure. Many, um, uh, I don't want to generalize, but for People in our, uh, some of my Latinx students and my colleagues, one of them told me that he grew up being told, go past that house fast, but once a year they would take him to the house and he would be brushed with leaves for cleansing. <clears throat> it's just very real. For some people, and many people who came to our show and continue to be in relationship with this, it's actually a negative connotation so bringing about the possibility of what you're seeing or all these other ways we could look at it is, is exciting. And if we, if we got into all the stories, you see that the way the witches um, use the term and how they rename themselves in the context of, you, you know, I'm not a witch, that's what you call me. Because you guys, you know, it's like that. It's one, that's one of the witches. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Uh, I. The Western idea of witchcraft is, takes a lot from different cultures and mythologies, from, especially from South Asian cultures, Southeast Asian, African cultures. So I wanted to ask you how you regard that in your work and um, how do you call it in your work? Because it's not named witchcraft, but it takes a lot from these other cultures. So, uh, yeah. it's, such a, it's such an important question. So. Some of that we handle in the context of the zine and in the writing. Some of it we handle through the individual story of each of the witches who are present. Um, and the witches have their own, the actual people in the piece have their own histories and their own relationships. And I rely on them to bring that forward. So how does that work? For one thing, they're all acknowledged every single second as a possibility, and I try to put myself back. Secondly, I do pose the question, am I the collector? Am I just like other white Western forms? Have I just collected all this and put this out here for people? And what's my complicity in, in it? Third, a really interesting book that's simply called Witches that is an incredible history and was a, a person's lifelong work. And he asked the question, and actually Mina, when I first met Mina, this is something that Mina and I were just talking about uh, early on in our relationship, is do you consider witches, shamans, wizards, 
holy people, are they all the same and can you even compare them or not? Interesting question. I don't have an answer. I'm only the thought that we need to keep raising it, asking it, talking about it, and checking in. What do you think? Do you, do you have a point of view about it yourself, how you wish it could be or want it to be? Um, I'm not sure, but I think including people from all around the world, because if, if, if it's like a performance that is based in America, it, it takes people mostly who are Americans into consideration. It's like a different, um, I'd say, perspective from where you've uh, grown up um, than where you're raised. But at the same time, I really respect that um, each individual is allowed to bring out their own story because everyone has their own culture and backgrounds. Yes. So yeah, I'm not sure about that, but yes, that's it, a good no, I, I mean, for me personally, that's kind of how I could do it right now. So Ruby's is in Spanish and Nia is um, totally engaged in African, uh, in African diasporic work. But let me just talk about Nia Love for a minute. Her father is Ed Love, who is just an extraordinary visual artist that some of you may know of. If not, you should look him up. Ed Love and I were in a uh, 10 years in a group in Washington, D.C. called Black Artists, White Artists. We met once a month and tried to work through issues of race and identity, and this was in the 1990s. Nia's his daughter, and I kind of knew her growing up, you know, growing up. So I believe the reason Nia was willing to do all that she did in bringing that to the public through this process is because I've been engaged with the family for 40 years. So when we talk about time and how we make things happen, I know change sometimes can be in an instant, but sometimes change takes long, long relationships. That's why you got, I know you're gonna value your relationships with people in this room because I hope they're lifelong. But it takes time, yeah. Okay, okay we are at three o'clock. Oh, one, okay, one, one more question. question. Yep. I, I promise I'll make it quick. Um, because your work uh, is very similar to my yeah, own, except, I'm sorry, oh, I'm right here. Oh, there you are, <laughs> Hi. thank you very much. Um, <laughs> your work is actually very similar to the stuff that I work on personally, um, through like witches, hags, or, um, but we work in different mediums, and I was really wondering, um, is Wicked Bodies, uh, is there a recording of it anywhere on the internet that we could look up and, and see the whole nine minute performance? I were in the midst of making the best possible version from the various touring dates, so we'll be ready soon, and I'll be sure to make sure you have links to it. You might be able to find bits of it, but I, I'd actually love you to see the whole thing. I, I, uh, yeah, I'll just add this as we get ready to go, and now I'm gonna hand it back to Elizabeth. So at the end, th there's a whole storyline which I haven't told you, an 88-year-old woman who was my teacher who was conjured up, and she's kind of uh, there. Anyway, she tells the witches that they, they have to go now. Uh, where, you ask? Well, they have to go to the border, they have to go to Kiev. Uh, and then she says, um, remember, every country has a Texas. Everybody needs protecting. Every witch has a story. And then they get on their stools. <laughs> they stretch out. <laughs> They're flying. And the smoke is going. And honestly, the audiences just jump up on their feet. And what I think is that at the end, <laughs> The, there's hope there, the witches are coming, but it, it's pretty fragile. They're just flying on stools, but they are coming. And that feels to me also one of our jobs right now is to find a way to just give people a little bit of lift so that we can, you know, face what we're facing. Okay, I'm passing it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Uh -huh. That's it. <laughs> oh, I do have to put the thing up. I'm putting the barcode up. Hold on. Oh, they. There we go. <laughs> you reminded me. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. They were so inspired. They're. Um, I mean, you know, this generation is so narrative, and they're so mythologically based, and ways to tell stories visually, and ways to um, 
get at the things that they care about